we begin our voyage down the Danube beside the recreation area of Margaret Island and make a non-stop passage through the city. Beyond Margaret Bridge is Hungary's Parliament Building. Built in the 1870s by French engineers, Margaret Bridge has a 15 degree bend at the point where the side span to Margaret Island joins. Construction of the Gothic Parliament building commenced in 1885. It took 19 years to complete and stands 96 metres, 310 feet, high. Squinting into the low afternoon sun, on the Buddha side we see St Anne's Church near the riverbank, the Matthias Church on the hilltop and the Calvinist Church also by the river. Away in the distance is the green dome of the Royal Palace on Castle Hill. Originally, Hilly Buda and Flat Pest were separate cities, until linked in 1849 by this chain bridge, built by British engineers. Of course, like all Budapest Danube bridges, it was destroyed in the 1939-45 war, so this is a reconstruction. Moored here permanently is paddle steamer Kostschut. Built in 1914, she's now a bar and restaurant. Another view of the Royal Palace on Buda's Castle Hill. Beyond Elizabeth Bridge, up on Gelliot Hill, stands the Independence Monument. While at the Pest end of the bridge is the parish church of the inner city. Moored at the first pier is a Ukrainian cruise ship. Visible beyond the green painted Liberty Bridge are the Corvinus University, noted for courses in economics and management, and the Great Market Hall. Sándor Petufi was a Hungarian poet and a leader of the 1848 revolution against Austrian rule. Close to Petufi Bridge is the start of a local rail line for the 13-minute run onto Cepel Island. These cultural centres have been built in recent years on the site of former railway sidings. Close beyond the modern road bridge is the railway bridge, linking the important Kellenfeld junction with the ferenc Farosh marshalling yards. Beyond the concrete mixing plant is the start of the channel which cuts off the 30 miles 48 kilometers of Chepel Island. Nearness to low cost water transport will have made this riverside area attractive to industry, although the West Bank is residential. A push tow is making its way upstream against the current. Nowadays, push tows are the norm, as they only require crew on the powered vessel. Barges towed behind a tug need a steerer. Now we approach the south side bridge of Budapest Ring Motorway. The device on the end of the long arm attached to the bridge pier is a radar reflector, invaluable in fog. The outer suburb of Nadi Tetany wisely keeps well back from the Danube floodplain. 
The usual schedules of cruise ships on the Lower Danube feature much overnight travel, mooring by day for city sightseeing. This film was made on two such trips with different itineraries, but it is presented in geographical order as if one journey. Now it's time for the evening meal. Then we shall resume in the morning, about 180 kilometers, 120 miles downriver. Next morning finds us moored at the last Hungarian town before the border. This is Mohac. This ferry links the town with several villages beyond the east bank of the river. As Mohac is held to have little of tourist interest, we are being bussed 25 miles to the university city of Pesh. In most guidebooks, the only mention of Mohac is as the place where the Hungarian army was beaten by the Turks in 1526. So today's Hungary was in the Ottoman Empire for 150 years. Pesh not only had a coal mine, but for a short time uranium was also mined near here. This mosque is a reminder of Turkish rule. We are like to visit the Roman Catholic Cathedral and marvel at its ornate interior with splendid frescoes on the walls and ceiling. In the city's main square are two symbols of former foreign rule, the Austrian-style Trinity Column and the mosque, which is now a church. Back aboard at Mohatch to watch a Roro barge departing upriver after a custom stop. Roro is short for roll on, roll off. This service carries lorries whose cargoes would be at risk during our route stops by road. There's probably also a considerable saving in driver's wages. Having received customs clearance for leaving the European Union for lands of former Yugoslavia, we back out, turn in midstream and head down river. Riverside second homes are popular but are liable to springtime flooding when far away alpine snows melt. The Hungarian courtesy flag is put away as we near the border. These cottages are in Vojvodina, an autonomous province of Serbia. The hilltop monument to a major victory of Tito's partisans in the Second World War is in Croatia, above the village of Batina. The entrance to the Veliki Canal, linking to the Tisa River and a network of small canals which the government of Serbia now hopes to develop for leisure use. Looking across to Batina's Catholic Church in Croatia as we turn to moor at the Serbian border post. The border post flies the Vojvodina flag, the same colours as Serbia but in a different order. In 2005, as our next call was to be in Serbia, we needed clearance from their officials. In that year, the process took about two hours as they checked everyone against their passport photographs. By the way, on non-tidal rivers, ships normally moor facing upstream. Thus, the current is divided by the bow, the sharp end, so reducing strain on the mooring lines. The Serbian courtesy flag is put away as we approach the bridge linking Croatia's Batina to Serbia's Bezdan, 
unseen three miles back from the river. Probably the next customer for the Serb border post. These holiday homes seem in imminent danger of flooding. In summer the river's very popular. People combine fishing and other sports with messing about in boats. A digging machine mounted in a barge is dredging. If this isn't done, sandbanks like this can build up, formed from material brought down by the river. Approaching the Serbian town of Apatin, we meet a Hungarian pushto. The wheelhouse, fixed on an arm, has been raised hydraulically for a better view. Most of Apatin is well back from the river, but the Serbian Orthodox Church of the Twelve Apostles is very prominent. Two large pushtos are fighting their way upstream. With lowered foremast, the tug of the first is Ukrainian. The second tow has an Austrian tug. The Danube is lined with trees for very many miles. Although preventing a view of the country beyond, their roots are essential in stabilizing the riverbanks. But when they've fallen, they can form a hazard. This is the normally busy port of Vukovar, but it is Sunday. Several vessels seem to be waiting to be unloaded. She's similar to many Bulgarian tugs, but is flying the flag of Ukraine. The ruin beyond the ferry ramp will be a relic of the recent conflict. As Croatia's main Danube port, Vukovar was heavily shelled in the Yugoslav war. We moored at Vukovar to be bussed across 20 miles of flat country to Osijek's historical quarter. Danube bridges in the city of Novi Sad had been destroyed in the Yugoslav war. We are approaching the soon to be finished Sloboda bridge. Until it is in use, Novi Sad is retaining its temporary pontoon bridge. It is open to shipping only three nights each week. It's the revolving radar scanner just above the ship's rail. Please excuse the jerky picture due to the camera being in its most sensitive night mode. Strategically placed on a low cliff, Petrovaradin Fortress guards the city from downriver invaders. 
formed of a roadway built on top of barges, the pontoon bridge has been opened for river traffic. The other end of the opened pontoon bridge with the fortress above. Known as the Rainbow Bridge, this one is the most centrally located. First to be rebuilt after the war, the railway bridge ahead is one of the lowest on the Danube. Provided with decking between the rails, it was used by road traffic between trains. Everyone on deck has been warned to sit down as we pass under the low bridge. As the passengers start rising, so too does the wheelhouse. It's hydraulically powered. We shall see Novi Sad in daylight on the way back upriver, as it was three years later. Leaving the city lights astern, we pass the first of the upriver cargo traffic to approach the opened pontoon bridge. Morning finds us 120 kilometers, 75 miles, downriver. Overnight we have passed Belgrade. We shall visit the Serbian capital on the way back. This looks to be a load of gravel, probably destined for the concrete mixers of Belgrade. The river is broadening, it's about a thousand yards wide here. This is the start of the industrial city of Smedarevo. This installation looks to be derelict. The port area straggles along the riverbank for four miles, six and a half kilometers. The port facilities are interrupted by the stone walls and towers of a large fortress. Not seen from the river, the steelworks, said to employ 7,000, was taken over by US Steel in 2003. A good safe distance out of town, the petroleum port. Now for a most unusual river crossing. It's a pipeline bridge. Actually, six pipes under an access walkway. The whole suspended and braced laterally by a network of wire cables. After the pipeline bridge comes a road bridge, also using the large island as an intermediate support. The island seems to form a nature reserve. Only 23 kilometers, 14 miles downstream, we come apparently to a lake. 10 miles further on, the river's flow is constricted through a gap in the first foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. When the water backs up, this swampy area becomes flooded. Now what's this large floating crane doing here? And this is a bucket dredger. Flooded vegetation. This village is named Ram. Long ago there was a Roman settlement here. As we round the considerable bend, a small ferry crosses behind us to Stara Palanka beside the mouth of the danube Tisa danube Canal, a link from the Veliki Canal we passed as we entered Serbia from Hungary. Stara Palanka is the last tiny place on the left bank in Vojvodina and in Serbia. So the river now forms the border between Serbia and Romania for the next 230 kilometers, 143 miles. We're now 12 miles downstream after pausing at the small town of Veliko Gradishta to be formally cleared out of Serbia. 
The first Romanian town and port we pass is Moldova Vecha. We're taking the left channel past an uninhabited Romanian island. This unusable bridge crosses to the island, which shows past earth-moving activity. Or was the enterprise abandoned before the bridge was completed? It's a mystery. Most passengers have come up on deck for the passage of the Iron Gate's gorges as the Danube cuts through the Carpathian Mountains. Until the construction of a huge dam at the lower end of the gorges, passage through the mountains was difficult and dangerous. The dam raised water levels for 100 kilometers, 62 miles. So these are the tops of trees which grew on the now submerged part of the island. The raised water level made it necessary to rebuild many villages and towns and to construct new roads along the riverbanks for all of that 100 kilometers. Only totalitarian states could afford it all. This rock is all there is to see now of Babakai Island, famous in legends of maidens being chained to its pinnacle. Now to see a little of the route to the west of the mystery island. This is the small town of Golobats. The raised road is already beginning to need elaborate engineering works. The quarry is well situated for low-cost water transport. Golobat's castle guards the entrance to the gorges. Note how the raised road is cut and tunnelled through this historic site. Scenes through the gorges were filmed at different times of day on the two journeys. The best views have been selected from both, care being taken to present them in correct geographic order. This extensive quarrying operation has its own barge loading facility. This convoy consists of three dumb or unpowered barges propelled by a Ukrainian motor barge. Before the dam raised water levels, this is where descending vessels would pick up a pilot to guide them through the perils ahead. An odd isolated location for a wharf but was there mining activity near here? The top of an old stone tower, one supposes, leading us to wonder how many other historical items have been submerged. Probably some kind of mine. Activity seems to have ceased. And 500 metres on, here's the workers' flats. Across on the Serbian side, the road is starting to be interesting. Distorted rock strata are testament to the massive forces exerted as the Earth's crust cooled.
Here comes a big convoy fighting upstream. Difficult to count, but we make it at least six barges propelled by two tugs. Over on the Serb side was a very important archaeological site. The Lepensky Ver settlements and sculptures are over 7,000 years old. Before the dam raised river levels, they were moved 30 metres higher to the site below the road. In the old days, one of the most dangerous rapids was here at the Narrows of Greben. For some years, there was a cable laid along the bed of the river. A special steam tug winched itself along the cable, towing trains of barges. Imagine having to rebuild higher a town of this size. The hinterland of Donley Milanovats has been noted for copper mining. The flooded Porechka Valley is now like an estuary. On the Romanian side is the disused loading wharf for coal from the mine at Ibental, reached by a tortuous road up into the hills. Another large tow with a Ukrainian pusher. We're coming now to the most exciting part, the Kazan Gorges. The Romanian road starts to climb over the hills. Remarkable how the vegetation clings to such steep slopes. They say the water's 80 metres, 260 feet deep through here. The cave would have been high above the torrent. The opposite bank is rather less vertical. A cold east wind funnelling through the gorges is spoiling the experience. The blue sign is used on the Rhine to signal the request to pass on the wrong side of an approaching vessel. Evidently, the water level is higher in times of flood. The rebuilt Romanian village of Dubova now clings to the hillside. Before the dam, it would have been on flat land beside the river. Looking back into the upper gorge of Kazan, as we turn to line up to the lower gorge. Perched precariously between road and river, the Murakania Monastery's survival seems an example of the power of prayer. Only 300 yards on, and tucked away in a side valley, is the 40 metre high rock sculpture of Decibalus, king of the Dacian tribe. Ten years' work for 12 craftsmen, it was commissioned by a wealthy Romanian businessman. In an amazing feat of construction, the Romans had built a road along what is now the Serbian bank. Of course, way below today's water level. This, the famous Trajan's tablet commemorating the achievement, was raised to this position. Anchored awaiting onward movement, these barges are above the original submerged village of Ogrodina.
The St. Annen Monastery on the hilltop must command a fine view. Across what's now a large bay is the relocated town of Orshova. Orshova has a large shipyard. Now comes the last gorge. Along here the water has risen so much it hardly looks like a gorge. Far below now is Ada Kale Island, a Turkish remnant of the Ottoman Empire. Another Ukrainian convoy. In the old days the Soviet Union of which Ukraine was part had a virtual monopoly of Danube cargo traffic due to rock bottom freight rates. Their tugs bristled with aerials eavesdropping on western radio traffic. A long freight train is passing on the Romanian side. Strictly speaking, this is the Iron Gates, but the name has come to be applied to the entire passage through the Carpathian Mountains. The Serbian courtesy flag is hoisted as we approach the lock on that side of the dam. Cranes on either side are able, together, to lift the massive lock gates if they get damaged. Duplicated gates are operated by huge hydraulic rams. Ships tie to floating bollards. They fall or rise with the water, avoiding any need to adjust the lines. What on earth? It's a giant mobile crane crossing below the middle gates. Just think of all those miles of water behind us, held back by the top gate. It's only a tiny leak, really. The line of daylight shows that the middle gate has started to open downwards. The tug ahead is moving into the lower chamber. We follow as the skipper adjusts the control of one of the twin steerable water jets which propel our ship. That crane is probably changing the filter screens which prevent river debris damaging the turbine blades of the electricity generating station. High above us, the control room. Beyond the lock wall, the Serbian generating station. Someone seems afraid of fire aboard a ship. Those water cannons are installed along both lock sides. This green electricity will be a major contribution to the national power supply. As we descend in the lower chamber, we can see, on top of this floating bollard, the kind of wood fragments which could damage power station turbines if not screened out of the water. Looking back at the dam, we see that beyond the Serbian power station are the overflow spillways, with the Romanian power station further to the right. The lock on the Romanian side is beyond that. We'll show the passage of it next. So, in better weather, we're on the Romanian side of that last gorge, heading for the other two-step lock. Far below, on the opposite side of the gorge, a short, narrow canal was built in the 1890s. Before that, towage through the rapids by a powerful steam locomotive on a specially built rail track had been tried. The graffiti is in Cyrillic. The floating bollards are now in high-vis paint. We'll be sharing the lock with this Bulgarian motor barge. One of only two bridges linking Romania and Serbia. Moving forward to the lower lock chamber allows a peep into the Romanian generating hall 
and the tops of its six turbo alternator sets. Outside are the transformers. Fed from the alternators, they step up their output to a higher voltage for efficient long-distance transmission. So, Romania too benefits from this generous supply of green electricity, releasing no CO2 into the atmosphere. As it's late summer, no surplus water flows over the spillways, except for the splashes of waves caused by the wind. A mile or so below the dam there's an island, but when spring's wild overflow is running, it's submerged. A pusher tug like this seems to be a floating brick, but be assured it's much more shipshape below the waterline. We're about 35 miles below the rushing overflows. It's flat country now, making for a wide, sluggish river. just identify the blue over yellow flag of Ukraine at the tug's stern, representing blue sky over golden cornfields, they say. Just visible, the barrage at the start of the bypass channel of the Prohovo Dam, itself still 8 miles, 13 kilometres, distant. This village is on an island. It has a ferry across the backwater. A first distant view of what's described as the second Iron Gates Dam and Lock, although it's 80 kilometres, 50 miles from the other. On the left, the generating station, then the spillways, and the lock is on the right. We think there may be a second smaller lock on a channel across the island, somewhere beyond the cranes. With an Austrian pusher, this will be iron ore for the steelworks at Linz, 1260 kilometres, 780 miles upriver. Behind the elevated control room is the second road bridge linking Serbia and Romania. There seem to be generating stations on both sides of the river. The overrun protection cables have been lifted clear and the bottom gates are opening. The town of Prohovo is ahead, well above flood level. Folks here seem to throw their rubbish towards the river. Now comes Prohovo's port, all at rest. Today's Sunday. And at a safe distance, the tanks of the petroleum port. 
Below here, the wide, slow river is edged with marshes, flooded by springtime's high waters. We resume some 250 kilometers, 150 miles, downstream. Here, the river forms the border between Romania and Bulgaria. The cargo port of the Bulgarian town of Nikopol. This far east, not everyone has yet converted to pushtos. Across in Romania, the industrial town of Tu New Magruela. We'll be mooring at Nikopol for a coach excursion to the historic quarter of Veliko Tarnova, a former capital of Bulgaria. First, some views of Nikopol. Now, views of Veliko Tarnova after the coach ride. But back on the river, we're approaching the important Bulgarian port of Rusa. That's a seagoing ship, about 500 kilometers, 300 miles from the river's mouth. But we are aiming for the Romanian port of Georgiou, almost opposite. Georgiou is the closest port to Bucharest, the Romanian capital. Navigation below this point can be difficult. It's too easy to run aground on sandbanks which tend to move, and the flat marshy terrain is boring for tourists. So from here it's by coach to Bucharest, then on to visit the Delta. The almost useless so-called People's Palace of the hated dictator Ceausescu, for which a large area was laid waste. Bucharest's excellent village museum has recreations of rural buildings from many Romanian regions. A wooden door lock. After several hours of road travel and an overnight hotel stay, we are at Tulcha, the Romanian town at the apex of the Danube Delta. Having an area of 5,600 square kilometers, 2,200 square miles, in the time available it's only possible to get an impression of this vast swampy expanse. Hauled out on a slipway for maintenance attention is one of the many hydrofoils used in this area. These high-speed craft have been a Russian speciality. There goes a hydrofoil now. some small ships of the Romanian Navy. This seems to be a Turkish bulk carrier.
but to experience the delta properly we must turn from the main channel. It's a paradise for fishermen and for fish-eating birds, but this close to town the wildlife is more wary. A river's delta forms where the flow slows as it reaches the sea. This causes all the material it has washed away from its banks to be deposited. Over many, many years it all builds up to new land and the process continues. We turn left at a waterway crossroads. This hauled tow looks to be for bank protection work. Grey Heron waits patiently. This heron doesn't like our company. These look to be coot. A fisherman's summer camp. They may have run aground while turning. A sun canopy seems a summer necessity here. As we stop to turn and go back, we can just make out low on the skyline the taller buildings of Izmir, a town in Ukraine. Next, we shall show you some sections of the Danube journey which could only be filmed going upriver. So, at Rusa in Bulgaria, the gangway is being lifted after passengers have boarded. This is across the Danube from Georgiou, where we had disembarked for Bucharest. For our next section of the return journey, we jump 650 kilometers, 400 miles upriver. We're in Serbia, between Smederevo and Belgrade. But the opposite bank is a marshy, wild expanse. We're overtaking a load of aggregate, destined for Belgrade's concrete mixers. The city's second home belt, and one of Belgrade's more conventional suburbs. There's only one Danube bridge at Belgrade. It carries a dual carriageway road. Along the centre is a railway. It's single track, but there's space for a second line. The bridge is post-war reconstruction on the old supports. The opposite bank of the Danube is quite undeveloped. We turn left into the Sava River. Belgrade is built beside the Sava rather than beside the Danube. 
In the mouth of the river Sava is a large island nature reserve. On the hilltop, the Kalamegdan Fortress, now a visitor attraction. This, the Sava River, is said to be navigable for 100 kilometers, 60 miles, and much more for small craft. The passenger moorings are full. We'll have to lie alongside another ship. Now some views of Belgrade. Leaping now 80 kilometers, 50 miles upriver, we are approaching the city of Novi Sad, which we had passed through by night in the downstream direction. The wheelhouse computer screen is a waterway sat-nav, a moving chart of the river and its hazards. We're passing the start of the Mali Canal. Novi Sad's cargo port is a little way up there. Close ahead now, the low railway bridge for which we had to sit down on the way downriver. But as the water is much lower now, our ship has ample clearance. A very wet and blustery day. The ship's main controls are duplicated on small side panels where the skipper gets a better view for mooring and for locking. The so-called Rainbow Bridge connects Petra Varadin with its historic fortress and central Novi Sad. We'll be moored to an old barge now serving as a pier. Now for a few glimpses of central Novi Sad in better weather. This was the notorious pontoon bridge. Its use ceased in September 2005. The weather's still unpleasant as we leave Novi Sad. A closer view of the Petra Varadin fortress and the remaining ramp of the pontoon bridge. On the opposite bank, dismantling seems to have started. As it probably had congested road approaches, this bridge has not been rebuilt. Instead, there's a new dual carriageway Sloboda Bridge with motorway style junctions on the approaches. Stremska Kamenica's lowest area is protected by a flood embankment. Early morning mist is rising off the water. 240 kilometers, 150 miles upriver in the middle of Hungary. Just ahead is the St. Laszlo Bridge on the Hungarian M9 motorway, an important cross-river link, one of only four road bridges between Hungary's southern border and the Budapest area. The river here is about 500 yards wide. Trade cars, probably both new and used, are being exported to lands downstream. preparation for our next mooring.
This quiet spot is six kilometres or four miles from the town of Kolosha. We are to go by road to a farm beyond for a display of the historic horsemanship of the Pusta, the Hungarian Great Plain. An even more misty early morning, this time for our entry to Budapest. Coming up to the bridge of the Ring motorway, just the conditions for which these radar reflectors are so useful The white-topped hump on the riverbank is the visible part of one of many shallow wells supplying Budapest's drinking water. They are fed by river water which has filtered through the natural layers of fine sand below ground in this area. Mm -hmm. 